Grace and peace to the name of God, our Father, and Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to this Ash Wednesday service here at First United Methodist Church in Salem, Virginia. We're so glad you're gathering with us this evening. As we begin worship together, hear first this call to worship. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Let us pray. O God, maker of everything and judge of all that you have made. From the dust of the earth you have formed us, and from the dust of death you would raise us up. By the redemptive power of the cross, create in us clean hearts, and put within us a new spirit, that we may repent of our sins and lead lives worthy of your calling. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. first scripture for this evening comes from Joel chapter 2 verses 1 through 2 and verses 12 through 17. Blow the horn in Zion. Give a shout on my holy mountain. Let all people of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and no light. A day of clouds and thick darkness like blackness spread out upon the mountains. A great and powerful army comes unlike any that has ever come before them or will come after them in centuries ahead. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your hearts, with fasting, with weeping, and with sorrow. Tear your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, very patient, full of faithful love, and ready to forgive. Who knows whether he will have a change of heart and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the horn in Zion. Demand a fast. Request a special assembly. Gather the people. Prepare a holy meeting. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the groom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the porch and the altar, let the priests, let the Lord's ministers weep. Let them say, have mercy, Lord, on your people. And don't make your inheritance a disgrace, an example of failure among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our New Testament reading for this evening comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20b through chapter 6, verse 10. We beg you as Christ's representatives, be reconciled to God. God caused the one who didn't know sin to be sin for our sake, so that through him we could become the righteousness of God. Since we work together with him, we are also begging you not to receive the grace of God in vain. 
He says, I listened to you at the right time, and I helped you on the day of salvation. Look, now is the right time. Look, now is the day of salvation. We don't give anyone any reason to be offended about anything so that our ministry won't be criticized. Instead, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in every way. We did this with our great endurance through problems, disasters, and stressful situations. We went through beatings, imprisonments, and riots. We experienced hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. We displayed purity, knowledge, patience, and generosity. We served with the Holy Spirit, genuine love, telling the truth and God's power. We carried the weapons of righteousness in our right hand and our left hand. We were treated with honor and dishonor and with verbal abuse and good evaluation. We were seen as both fake and real, as unknown and well-known, as dying, and look, we are alive. We were seen as punished but not killed, as going through pain but always happy, as poor but making many rich, and as having nothing but owning everything. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our gospel reading for this evening comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, and verses 16 through 21. 
Be careful that you don't practice your religion in front of people to draw their attention. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Whenever you give to the poor, don't blow your trumpet as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may get praise from people. I assure you, that's the only reward they'll get. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that you may give to the poor in secret. Your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't be like hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people will see them. I assure you, that's the only reward they'll get. But when you pray, go to your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is present in that secret place. Your Father who sees that what you do in secret will reward you. And when you fast, don't put on a sad face like the hypocrites. They distort their faces so people will know they are fasting. I assure you that they have the reward. When you fast, brush your hair and wash your face. Then you won't look like you are fasting to people, but only to your Father who is present in that secret place. Your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Stop collecting treasures for your own benefit on earth, where moth and rust eat them, and where thieves break in and steal them. Instead, collect treasures for yourselves in heaven where moth and rust don't eat them, and where thieves don't break in and steal them. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you please pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When we talk about Ash Wednesday, what we're really talking about is an opportunity to be together at least once a year and to remind ourselves of a few, few things. The first thing that we remind ourselves is that we are dust and to dust we shall return, right? That's what you hear when you typically come up for ashes. And, and it's a, it's, it reminds us of several things. First, it reminds us of, of God's creation of us and, and God's good creation of us. It also, ashes are a sign of repentance, and so in thinking about ashes, we think about our willingness uh, and desire to turn away from the things that, that, that are preventing us from being uh, the kind of people God created us to be, preventing us from loving God the way we were created to, preventing us from loving each other the way we were needed to. And it's not, it's not meant to be necessarily a holy guilt trip, but it is an opportunity um, to think about our guilt, but then to immediately be met with the reality uh, that God has all of this in our hands because the final, the final piece of remembering that you are dust and to dust you shall return is simply that we, uh, none of us get out of this life alive, that all of us return to the dust. And yet, across all pieces of this, of our creation, of our brokenness, and as well as our death, all of it, we're reminded, is in God's hands and in God's love, that our desire to change is met with God's love and grace and forgiveness. Our creation was something that came from God, and even ultimately our death is swallowed up in resurrection because of Jesus Christ. And so we bring all of those together as we gather together on, on Ash Wednesday, a willingness to want to be changed by God, met with God's grace, met with God's grace as we gather together and to think about what it means to be during Lent. And, and part of that is to think about, about our baptism, about the promises that we have made uh, as people who follow Jesus. And those kinds of promises are not ones that you make them one time and then you keep them forever. Uh, that would be an ideal situation, but in reality, they're promises that we, we seek to live out each day, that we make choices about each day, that we live into God's grace. And I just wanna spend a minute thinking about that as we enter into this Lenten season, these promises, right? The first one that we hear about is when we are either confirmed if we were baptized as infants or when we're baptized when we're um, able to speak for ourselves is first do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin right the the first move is to is to renounce sin and evil the first move is to be prepared and and want to want to change to want to repent remember that's the sign of the ashes is a a desire 
to change, a willingness to move towards repentance. And that's, of course, the first move of baptism as well, because each day we have the opportunity to renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, to reject the evil powers of this world. Each day is an opportunity for repentance, because inevitably we do things that keep us from God and from each other. We sin. The next question, do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression, whatever forms they present themselves? It reminds us that in Jesus Christ, we are not captive to the powers of this world. And it's important that the language talks about the powers of this world, because as much as it is about my sin and your sin and our individual inability to live the way that God created us to, it, there are powers amongst us in the world that we participate, systems that are in fact broken that we participate in as well, that we are called not just to renounce, but to resist, to name, and to, and to work uh, for transformation, which is really Christ's transformation of which we get to participate. And all of it comes down in this last question. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Right? The central confession is Jesus Christ. All of it was wrapped together. Yes, we have a desire to change and repent, but even that comes from Jesus himself. All, all of that comes from Jesus on the cross. The grace that comes to help us to know that we need to change and make us want to change. The grace that comes when we offer ourselves as followers of Jesus Christ and the grace that comes to us in that moment based on what Jesus did for us and then growing and living into these promises the rest of our life, which we as Methodists, we talk about that as sanctifying grace, sanctification, being made holy by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and us responding to that grace. Lent is a, an amazing time to have the opportunity to think about that, to focus on it, to, to give something up, to focus more on our discipleship or to take something on. That's the purpose of those things, is to, is to, to give us a holy awareness, not just of our brokenness, but of what God is doing in us to change us. Now, of course, since this is a virtual service, uh, we can't apply any ashes. And in fact, I don't recommend doing ashes at home. Uh, there, ashes can actually be sort of tricky. Uh, when you mix ashes for this sort of thing, uh, you actually need to use oil and not water. Uh, if you use water, ashes can actually be caustic to the skin. And so um, it's not necessary though for you to have the ashes at home because what the ashes represent again is a willingness and a desire to change. And that desire, it comes from God. Uh, and God's grace meets it, the desire to want to do it. Uh, the, the ashes are a sign of it. They point to it. They're a public way of demonstrating it. Whether you wear the ashes around in the world to publicly proclaim your need for, for God's grace, which is what that is, publicly proclaiming that you're broken and that you need God's grace, or if, if when people leave the service, they wash them off and they, they, you know, they keep their, um, their prayer in secret, just like it says in, uh, in Matthew chapter 6 that we read earlier. Whatever that looks like for you, if you're at home and you're watching uh, and, and, and you're not able to actually have ashes, fine. Because the repentance and the desire, that's the real thing that matters. And that's the real thing that comes first from God's grace and God's grace meets it in, in God's ability to, to transform us. And so based on all of that, I can still offer you this invitation to the observance of Lenten discipline. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the early Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection, and it became the custom of the church that before the Easter celebration, there should be a 40-day season of spiritual preparation. During this season, converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism. It was also a time when persons who had committed serious sins and had separated themselves from the community of faith were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored to participation in the life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the need we all have to renew our faith. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the church to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word to make a right beginning of repentance. And as a mark of our mortal nature, let us now bow before our Creator and Redeemer. Even though 
We can't virtually give ashes. We can hear the words that matter in the imposition of the ashes. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Repent. Believe the gospel. These are the two central things we hear, and then we offer confession. And so I invite you to join me uh, in this prayer of confession. The prayer itself comes from Psalm 51, and I'm going to read it, and I hope that you will join me in it. I'll be reading the version that is in our United Methodist hymnal, Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was born into iniquity and I have been sinful since my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me here with joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. Were I to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Hear this word of pardon. May the Almighty and merciful God who desires not the death of a sinner, but that we turn from wickedness and live, accept your repentance, forgive your sins, and restore you by the Holy Spirit to newness of life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So grateful that you joined us tonight for this Ash Wednesday virtual service. We hope that you'll continue to worship with us throughout the season of Lent, whether you join us here at, at the church building uh, in the fellowship hall for Genesis services at 845 in the morning or, or uh, 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary, or if you're still continuing to worship with us virtually 845 on Sunday mornings. We're just so glad you're with us, so glad that you're gathered, and, and we look forward to the opportunity to observe a holy Lent with you. So hear this final word of blessing as we go forth. Go forth now in the name of the one who sends grace. Grace to help us to recognize our need to change, grace to change, and grace to grow in grace. We pray for this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.